When wrestling entrances go well, they can sometimes outshine the match to come with their spectacle and grandeur. But other times, they're remembered for all the wrong reasons. Randy Orton hated his original theme music, Burning My Light. Lots of fans loved the song and even sang along with the Hey, Nothing You Can Say lyrics, but the Apex Predator couldn't stand it. In a 2008 interview with GameDaily.com, Orton said of the song, I hated that for all four years. I hated it from the first day I heard it. They even tried to tweak it a bit, and I still hated it. WWE tried more than just tweaking it. On a 2006 episode of SmackDown, they changed the Legend Killer's music to CM Punk's first WWE theme, This Fire Burns, by Killswitch Engage. That song did not fit the Viper at all, and it was incredibly jarring to have a relatively clean-cut Randy Orton come out to such grungy-sounding music. WWE changed Orton's music back to Burn In My Light two weeks later. The Apex Predator would have to suffer through a few more years of the song he hated before WWE changed his music in 2008 to the song he still comes out to today, Voices. AEW Double or Nothing 2019 was the company's first ever official pay-per-view. Fans were excited to see what a legitimate alternative could offer. Things took an interesting turn when Cody Rhodes made his entrance for his match against his brother, Dustin Rhodes. The American Nightmare took a sledgehammer to a Triple H stylized throne, a clear shot at WWE. Fans were notably divided over the stunt. Some said the knock at WWE and Triple H was petty and that AEW should be above it. But Cody was never shy about taking shots at WWE and Triple H specifically, even bringing out a golden shovel in one of his last ever AEW matches. All of these shots look a little awkward now that the American Nightmare is happily back in WWE. At AEW Revolution 2020, Cody created a whole different controversy that overshadowed not only his match with MJF, but almost the entire show. That night, the American Nightmare first showed the world his now infamous neck tattoo. His new ink was one of the most talked about things on the whole pay-per-view, with many fans mocking Cody's design and placement choices. It sure didn't help that Cody's entrance music, Kingdom, was played live by the band Downstate. For whatever reason, the performance simply did not sound good at Revolution, and fans were quick to register their distaste for it. MJF even brought up the whole debacle on the Pardon My Take podcast. My first ever singles pay-per-view match, the spotlight was on a neck tattoo. On a 2013 episode of Impact, ring announcer Christy Hemme was introducing the heel tag team of Austin Aries and Bobby Roode. In doing so, Hemi accidentally introduced the wrong team, instead introducing Aries and Rude's opponents' bad influence. Rude and Aries looked understandably annoyed at the mistake, as any heel team would be, and made Hemi reintroduce them the proper way. But then A-Double took things a little further as he cornered Hemi in the turnbuckles, then stepped up onto the middle rope, putting his crotch in her face. TMZ reported that Aries was given a severe fine for the incident, and TNA president Dixie Carter revealed on Twitter the punishment was swift. She wrote, TNA has zero tolerance for inappropriate behavior. The incident with Austin Aries was taken very seriously and handled immediately. Hemi likewise called the incident unacceptable on Twitter. Years later, fans brought up the incident again as part of the speaking out movement with Aries being labeled as a sexual harasser for his actions. Victory Road 2009 has become known as one of TNA's worst pay-per-views of all time. It had a match that's in the running for the worst to ever occur on a major televised event, Jenna Maraska versus Charmel. Plenty of articles and podcasts have discussed the many negative aspects of the match itself at length, but it started off pretty poorly with Maraska's entry. Jenna Maraska was not a wrestler, she was a reality TV star who won the Survivor the Amazon season in 2003. TNA presumably wanted to use her mainstream appeal to draw in some casual fans. It didn't work. On the Wrestling Observer's The Brian and Vinny Show, Brian Alvarez called Maraska's walk to the ring as the lewdest entrance I've ever seen, describing it as a cross between the entrances of the beautiful people and Melina. Co-host Vincent Verheide joked that it seemed that Maraska was looking not to just show off her rear end, but her entire anatomy. 
Then he then added, It looked for all the world that Jenna had gone on Survivor and earned her, earned her money, and her goal was now to channel this success into a career in hardcore pornography. What more could be said about the Shockmaster? Even if you weren't around to watch his debut as it aired on WCW Clash of the Champions 24 in 1993, you've probably seen it. The glittery Stormtrooper helmet is funny enough on its own, but that trip and fall has gone down as one of the most famous botches and most hilarious entrances in wrestling history. It's still a meme today. Speaking to WWE.com, Fred Ottman, the man behind the infamous Stormtrooper helmet, said, There was a board just below my knee that was there for support. I got there, and when it was time to go, they said, You're going to have to hit this wall really hard to bust out, because it wasn't a gimmick wall. So I put my hands above my head, double axe handle, and when I got the cue, I was going to blast through the wall. Well, I blew the top out, but didn't take that bottom board out, so I basically was a human teeter-totter. Ottman continued explaining that after he fell on the floor, he quickly put the helmet that had fallen off back on and stood up so that Ole Anderson, who was supplying the Shockmaster's voice, could continue his plan and deliver the promo from backstage. Many focus on the fall, but even without that, this was a terrible idea for an entrance, not to mention an awful gimmick that was clearly dead on arrival. The Undertaker is known for having a legendary, awe-inspiring entrance. The gong and the ominous walk to the ring strike fear in the hearts of his opponents. It's often one of the best entrances in all of wrestling. At the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view in 2010, however, his entrance was awe-inspiring for all the wrong reasons. As The Undertaker made his entrance for the Elimination Chamber match, there was a pyro malfunction which saw the dead man become engulfed in a fireball from the stage. Immersed in flames, The Undertaker ran to the ring tearing off his leather trench coat while intensely staring down all the other competitors in the chamber. To the audience, it looked like The Undertaker was trying to intimidate his opponents. Little did they know he was suffering from first and second degree burns to his chest and arms. On Broken Skull Sessions, The Undertaker told Steve Austin about how he was able to work through such intense pain, saying, The adrenaline needle is peaked right here. I'm beside myself. I'm looking down at my chest because my chest is just bubbling up right now, flesh is just rolling. Even worse, The Undertaker's night had only just begun. He continued, I know that I've got to sit in that pod for 20 minutes, and then I've got to work another 20 minutes once I get in. Every time I look down, my skin is bubbling up more and more. Motorhead has played Triple H to the ring on two occasions, WrestleMania 17 and WrestleMania 21. The Game is a song wrestling fans tend to agree they like, and considering Motorhead performed the track themselves, one would assume they would know the lyrics. But for whatever reason, lead singer Lemmy didn't seem to know all of the words on both occasions he sang it at WrestleMania. Motorhead didn't actually write the song. It was written by Jim Johnston, WWE's in-house musician from the mid-80s until 2017. On total engagement with Matt Kuhn, Johnston said Triple H even wrote some of the lyrics himself, much to Johnston's annoyance. I know that Lemmy changed two lines on something that Triple H naturally made him change without consulting the actual writer of the song. I actually think that Lemmy, who was a wild and crazy guy, was a pretty class act at the end of the day. I think he was pretty uncomfortable with that because he would know how he would feel if someone took one of his songs and just decided to change the lyrics. It's kind of an unwritten code, you just don't do that. Johnston reiterated to Chris Van Vliet that Lemmy was great to work with despite the singer's reputation as a wild man. Then to finally meet him and be in the studio with him, he just could not have been more of a gentleman. Either way, it's funny that Lemmy forgot the words, but he is so iconic that the performance has still worked out pretty well in the end. David Flair had a rather strange wrestling career. For somebody with seemingly little talent for the business, he managed to achieve some success in WCW thanks to his famous dad. His career in the WWF, however, was a different story. When WCW was sold to the World Wrestling Federation, the WWF picked up his contract and sent him to developmental. And then he made a grand total of two appearances on the main roster in the build to WrestleMania 18 during his father Ric Flair's feud with The Undertaker. The WWF's lack of interest in David Flair 
was apparent in these two appearances. In the first, he was beaten up by The Undertaker. Then, he was squashed by the dead man in a match a few weeks later. David's Titantron video for this match would make fans laugh for years to come. His theme music was generic, but the video was downright embarrassing. It showed David striking a half-hearted pose, followed by a clip of Rick looking disappointed. And that was it. Just those two clips looped over generic jobber music. It was so bad it almost looked fan-made.